is Ivan Castle. So, Ivan, can you please get your screen sharing yes, up? I can. All right. Um, thank you very much, Bronson, and the other organizers for the opportunity to speak to all of you today. So, I'll talk about the classification of coherent enhancements of light harvesting processes and how that's related to organic semiconductors. So before I run out of time, I want to thank the people in my group who did this work, um, especially, uh, this is us on Zoom because we were very uh, working, this is from last year, especially Stefano Tomasi over here, uh, who did most of the work that I talked about, who I, that I'll talk about today, and also Daniel Balzer over here, whose uh, work I'll mention in the end. And uh, for those of you um, that I haven't met, my group does um, assorted things in um, chemical dynamics area. We're interested in charge and energy transport, especially in organic electronics, but also in other kinds of systems and including coherent light harvesting photosynthesis, that sort of stuff. And I also have another uh, quantum schmantum research direction um, involving quantum computers. Um, so the, the today I wanna tell you that coherence in light harvesting matters, but only sometimes. And it's very important to get the language straight because the word coherence gets abused a lot. So I'll try to shed some light on that. Um, and in particular, one kind of coherence that's very important is delocalization among many molecules, which can enhance exciton transfer or charge transfer. And this has a big effect in photosynthesis. And this is how I got into this field. And so I'll kind of give you some photosynthetic examples first, instead of slamming you with equations at the very beginning. Uh, but I'll bring out the equations a little bit later to show how we classified possible coherent enhancements of light harvesting. So all different possibilities of how different kinds of coherence might enhance the efficiency of light harvesting. And then I'll show how this is relevant to or give some examples of how this is relevant in organic electronics, where we're finding that the localization is likely to be crucial for things like mobilities and IQEs of organic photovoltaics, but has largely been neglected due to the uh, in simulations because of the computational cost. Um, so first of all, here's uh, what um, for this photosynthetic antenna looks like. I, I said I'd, I'd lead it with uh, an example from photosynthesis. Uh, this is an example of, uh, of um, the light harvesting apparatus of purple bacteria. You've got reaction centers in blue. This is where the excitons want to get to, but in order to harvest as much light, they're surrounded by antenna complexes in these red and green. And then the idea is that, I mean, this is a crude and incredibly incorrect cartoon from a high school textbook, but the idea is that photons come in are absorbed by some of these peripheral antenna pigments and then hop around until they reach the reaction center where they can be converted, you know, they can drive charge separation and be converted into chemical fuels. Um, now about 10-ish, 15-ish years ago, there was a lot of uh, hullabaloo about quantum effects in photosynthesis. People have done, um, experiments, uh, I mean, totally legitimate experiments, uh, ultra-fast uh, coherent uh, spectroscopic experiments, which showed coherent oscillations in the photosynthetic signatures or in the sig spectroscopic signatures of photosynthetic um, complexes. And, you know, if the excitons were to be moving around diffusively in a classical way, you would not see oscillations. Oscillations indicate that something is oscillating. So that suggests that something is wave-like. And once there's waves, there's coherence. Okay, and so that was a very, uh, uh, became a very exciting field. Uh, and what got me interested in, in it was asking whether all of these things matter in sunlight, because sunlight is not a femtosecond laser. Um, and so does this uh, play a role? And the answer is no. Uh, so sunlight is a stationary process. It's not a pulsed laser. And as a result, the molecular ensemble that you're probing is also stationary. So you can think, I think of it as a kind of heat engine where light, the sunlight coming in is hot, the environment is cold, and then the, most of the energy just goes straight through, but the organism skims some of it uh, off the side. Uh, just like a, any kind of engine would. Uh, so as a result, it, it, because it's at steady state, it means that there's no change happening in the ensemble, which means you don't have any dynamical coherence. You don't have any waves. Things aren't going up and down, changing like that. Okay, so that uh, aspect of the field has uh, sort of been a bit of a dead end. But 
even so, even if transport is at steady state, other forms of coherence can influence the efficiency in other ways. So not in a dynamical way where you would see beatings in spectroscopy. Those are just artifacts of the ultra fast excitations, but there's other kinds of coherence. And the problem here is that the word coherence gets used in many different ways. I've counted about six or seven, some of them mutually exclusive, uh, mutually incompatible. And uh, I'm not gonna try to explain all of them today, um, but I will talk about the one that I think is most important. So the dynamical coherence I just said is sort of dynamics, things that are waving. Uh, that's a sort of, that's a way of you can think about coherence, but delocalization among different kinds of molecules or any atoms or any sort of entities is also a form of coherence because it preserves definite phase relationships between different subunits. Um, and I, I'm going to call that as coherence in a site basis because I'm going to imagine a basis of two sites. Uh, here, two molecules, uh, one basis is going to, element is going to be called left and the other is going to be called right. And these states, L and R, denote the exciton or the charge or whatever being on one of those basis um, uh, molecules being localized on a, on a particular site. Um, and, but, or if, if these sites are closely coupled, then you're going to start getting a splitting between the two states. So this is exactly the same as what happens in the hydrogen molecule. If you have two hydrogen atoms and you bring them together, the atomic orbitals form the molecular orbitals, which are no longer degenerate. You get what in, what in uh, electronic structures called the bonding orbital and the anti-bonding orbital. In this field, if these were excitons, these would be called excitonic states. And you get one which is a equal, they're both equal superpositions, but in this one, there's a, the phase there, the two molecules are in phase, whereas here they're out of phase. Okay, so alpha, this lower lying state is left plus right divided by square root of two, and the higher one has a minus sign. And because there's this definite phase relationship between left and right in both of these states, you can see that both of these delocalized states are coherent superpositions of side states. Ivan, Ivan, it's Paul yes. Ben. I'll just interrupt for a sec. So Please. in this case, are you saying that the um, alpha and beta states are equal or if kind of equal but opposite in, in, in energy? Because in the molecular yes. orbital component, it, it's sort of, um, you know, the anti-bonding, if you like, uh, is, um, uh, is uh, different in energy than the, the bonding. That's right. Yes. Yeah, so in this diagram, um, the, um, the splitting here is equal both ways. And so uh, normally in these kinds of, uh, you would describe this with a Hamiltonian, which is a two by two matrix and the coupling between the two is J and then you get a splitting J. Now in molecular orbitals, uh, Paul's absolutely right. This anti-bonding orbital tends to be higher up than, uh, so it's destabilized more than the bonding orbital is stabilized. This is because for atomic orbitals, the couplings are so strong and you tend to have very large overlaps between the two um, atomic orbitals and these overlaps change the mass a little bit. Uh, in excitonic models, uh, it's nearly universal to assume that the overlaps are very small. And so as a result, it's a fair approximation to say that uh, the, this, is, this stabilization is equal to this destabilization. Um, now, if you have delocalization, this can change your dynamics and the kinds of processes that are happening, right? So if you have regular uh, exciton transfer from um, two molecules where the exciton can be on either donor one or donor two, if I have regular force or resonance energy transfer, I can end up, I have to add up the two different rates. I just add up the rates. But if I have delocalized excitonic states, so it's, I have a superposition of the two states, then they can form a, an effective transition dipole moment, which is very large, larger by in fact a square root of two than either of these. And it's this collective uh, transition dipole which then communicates with the acceptor. And because it's a larger transition dipole, the rate ends up being, or the transfer rate ends up being larger, in this case by a factor of two. But in general, if you had N donors and M donors, which were separately delocalized over each other, then you would get an enhancement of up to a factor of n 
times m. Um, and this has been called super transfer. It's a manifestation of faster exciton transfer from A to B because of the presence of delocalization in either the donor or the acceptor. And we've shown that this plays a huge, a big role in, uh, in, in, in photosynthesis. So again, here is the antenna complex of LH2. Uh, if you zoom in, there's a bunch of chlorophyll molecules, but they're so strongly coupled that you can get, you can write a Hamiltonian for them, but they're so strongly coupled that you can imagine excitons being delocalized around the ring. In reality, they're not delocalized entirely around, but over large segments, but that's a detail. In either event, you end up with large dipole moments in some low energetically low-lying state. So this is the N exciton energy uh, as a function of oscillator strength. And you see that almost all the oscillator strength is in a few low-lying excitons. So they, you can draw these large errors. So the hypothesis that we set out to test was whether this helped the transfer, right? So in a picture like this, this is again kind of zoomed in, these LH2 antennas absorb the light, and then the excitons that are generated have to be transferred from LH2, well, for example, from this LH2 to this LH2, then from LH2 to LH1, this ring, the blue ring around here, and then from that into the reaction center. And the idea is that if you have delocalization within each of these aggregates, each of them has a very large dipole moment, and these large dipole moments coupled to each other, and so the theory would go is you would get large transfers and the exciton would be able to reach the reaction center faster, giving a higher efficiency because it wouldn't have time to recombine. And this is what we've seen. Now we've done a lot of calculations about this, but I want to show you the most interesting one to me. Uh, we sort of had a simulation like this of a whole bunch of um, uh, chromophores simulating a collection of, of these um, um, aggregates like this. But then we change their orientation. So the nice thing about photosynthetic complexes as opposed to OPVs is that the structure is known from uh, X-ray scattering. Uh, but then we change the orientations. And if you change the orientations of the independently of each of the molecules, and if you change the way the chlorophylls are pointing, you can destroy the delocalization because things end up just not lining up as they should. Um, and here's the result, the natural, um, um, LH2s and LH1s have a very high efficiency of exciton transfer to the reaction center. I mean, these are models, so it's not exactly whatever it says here, 73%. But the point is that the random orientations, the distribution of those is significantly below the natural uh, uh, geometry. So the natural geometry really is pushing the optimum of what is possible with the sort of planar arrangement of of uh, chlorophyll molecules. And this is because it relies on super transfer as a coherent enhancement for light harvesting. Um, and so uh, the same thing, by the way, happens in the reaction center. So once the, uh, if you have an antenna and then it needs to transfer to the reaction center, this is um, a question I've been interested in for a long time because it's an ancient question of why all all photosynthetic reaction centers are dimeric. They all look like this. They have two branches. And at the top is a special pair. And this special pair involves two chlorophylls, which are very tightly coupled. And what this causes is delocalization within the special pair. That changes the energetics. And it changes whether it can participate in super transfer. So again, we've done a lot of simulations to try to understand how these coherent effects play a role. And it turns out that uh, our best guess of why dimerism evolved uh, 4 billion years ago and hasn't gone away since is because it enhances the transfer of excitons from the antenna, both by changing the energetic landscape, but also by using super transfer. And doing that can enhance the efficiency of the trapping uh, by up to a factor of two. And the one that exists in real life is quite efficient. Okay, so uh, that's the example of the importance of super transfer as a particular kind, the one that I think is most important, a particular form of a coherent enhancement mechanism for light harvesting. But um, after we'd sorted that out, we were interested in uh, classifying the others. Is it like, is that the only one? How many are there? Can we say something intelligent about it? And to do it, 
um, we started with two observations. The first is that coherence is a basis dependent concept, and this is very much tied to the what I told you before about coherence being used in many different ways. So uh, the same diagram that I had before of two uh, localized exciton states coming together to form delocalized ones or two hydrogen orbitals forming um, molecular orbitals, or the, the signs are wrong here for if these were MOs. Uh, but the idea is that you can represent either these collected states as superpositions of local states, right? So plus is a superposition of left and right, but you can also do it the other way around. You can say that left is a superposition of plus and minus. So in that sense, uh, depending on which basis you're thinking about, whether you're thinking in the side, if you're thinking in the side basis, then um, uh, these eigenstates are coherent, but if you're thinking in the eigenstate basis, then the side states are coherent. And um, for those of you who like equations, the point here is that there's a freedom, a unitary, you know, if, if you do a change of basis, a unitary transformation on your density matrix, something that's diagonal in one basis will not be diagonal in just about any other basis. And so that tells you that the off diagonal elements, which are the coherences, um, these can change depending on the basis. So the, in that sense, coherence is not a fixed property of the world, but you have to specify what basis you're talking about. That's observation number one. The second observation is about different ways in which uh, in efficiencies can be enhanced. And there's really two ways. One is better trapping. So you get the excitons to where you want them fast or you decrease the loss, so the recombination is slowed down. Okay, so either they get there faster or they don't get lost along the way as fast. Those are the two possible ways, there's nothing else, right? Excitons are always gonna get to the trap unless they get recombined, uh, unless they recombine beforehand. And with that, that's enough to come up with this little um, table chart, which shows the different kinds of possible enhancements. And an, an important um, finding, which I'm not going to explain, but you can read it in this paper, is that enhancement is impossible if dissipation, so things like trapping and loss, if those things are acting in the same basis as the coherence. So if you're interested in side basis coherence, which is delocalization, um, that cannot enhance efficiency if all the dissipation in your system is in the side basis. If everything is in the side basis, then it's just classical dynamics and nothing interesting or coherent can happen. On the other hand, if you're interested in how delocalization can enhance efficiency, then you get into this regime here, which we call type one enhancements. These can happen only when there's dissipation in the energy basis. So uh, there's trapping or losses happening from the energy basis and super transfer is one of the two possibilities here. The other is called dark state protection, which was also hypothesized about uh, 10 years ago. Uh, they're both manifestations of the same thing, except the only difference being whether it's the trapping that's being enhanced or whether it's the recombination that's being suppressed. So you can enhance the efficiency either by speeding up trapping or slowing down recombination. And there's another quadrant here where um, 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 uh, enhancement is possible. This is if you have dissipation in the site basis, but you're interested in coherences in the energy basis. These are usually what's sometimes just called coherence, but this depends on which community you're in. Um, and we've studied one of those as a way of engineering, um, uh, engineering molecular coherences in the energy basis. And the idea is if you have light that comes in, if you imagine a dimer, these are molecules, but I'm a theorist, so I'm allowed to draw them like this. And I have three molecules and light, I can either have incoherent light coming in or light that has definite phase properties or polarization or the details aren't terribly important, but depending on whether the different colors of the light, for example, are in phase or out of phase, I can excite different superpositions of eigenstates and different superpositions of eigenstates correspond to states which are localized in the side basis. So I can localize excitations either on the left molecule or on the right molecule. And if I localize it on the right molecule, it's close to the acceptor. And then I'm going to get higher efficiency than if I localize it far away on the donor. 
And so this is a way that you could controllably uh, affect the outcome of a light harvesting event just by from externally controlling coherences in the system. So you're inducing coherence within the system by controlling the optical coherence of the light coming in, right? Whether you have incoherent light or coherent light that's coherent in different ways. And the enhancement can be quite large in these dimeric systems. You can enhance the efficiency. So if, if yellow here is the efficiency in the incoherent case, uh, the coherent case with just the right phases, you can double the, you can as much as double the efficiency. Uh, so this is an example of a type two enhancement. It's very different from super transfer, but here we're now thinking in the energy basis. Okay, and so um, now how, what does this have to do with organic electronics? Well, um, for a variety of reasons, the one, it, lots of people have hypothesized different kinds of um, coherences as being important in organic electronics. Some of those trace back to the uh, ultra fast spectroscopic experiments. Those again, just looking for the synthesis are not relevant for device function. But there are other kinds of coherence and other kinds of coherent enhancements that do matter. And the one that I think really matters, the only one that I think is going to matter for practical purposes is super transfer or versions of it. Um, now, organic electronics, um, I mean, this crowd, I don't need to explain this to you, but you know, it's a very complicated multi-scale uh, assemblage of molecules. And uh, in particular, what interests me the most is how charges separate in an organic photovoltaic at a heterojunction. And people have, and this is one area where coherence or delocalization has been bandied about as an explanation. Uh, correct one, uh, as I will show you in just a second. So this is uh, an excellent review from Jenny Nelson's group. Uh, and you can see that these two top uh, uh, diagrams, these are kind of proposed explanations of how charges in a heterojunction separate. How do they get enough energy to overcome their Coulomb interaction? And there's all kinds of possible explanations, but the top two involve delocalization, which is either intramolecular or intermolecular. In either case, the idea is that if the charge is smeared out over multiple molecules, then um, the, the center of the charges are effectively further apart. So they're not as tightly bound as if they were localized on individual molecules very you know, next to each other on the interface. Now, the one, if there's one takeaway message for those of you who don't care about any of this coherence business, but you just wanna have a, um, um, a thing to seize on. I mean, if you're, if you're interested in, in transport in organic semiconductors, then my message here is that hopping transport often fails. We often model hopping uh, transport in organic semiconductors as hopping, you know, electron, for example, hops or exciton from one molecule to another and so on because it's disordered. But this in general fails and you can underestimate mobilities by an order of magnitude or more. And so uh, I'm not going to repeat this because those of you who attended uh, Daniel's talk uh, last year would have heard a greater um, explanation of this, but his findings are that um, organic semiconductors are an intermediate transport regime. It's not perfect hopping, which is what you would expect in perfectly localized states in a perfectly disordered material. Uh, where you have totally incoherent transport, but they're also not, you know, they're not um, silicon or gallium arsenide where you have extended, uh, you know, extended uh, band states, band conduction and coherent transport. They're somewhere in between. And so we need new theoretical tools to describe this, which, because these two extremes both fail. And um, so Daniel um, and other members of my group developed this and I'm running out of time, so I'll skip the details, but the main, um, point of that paper is, um, is this slide here, which shows you how delocalization really makes a huge difference. So purple is if you don't include delocalization. This is classical hopping, mobility as a function of coupling. So how tightly coupled are molecules, uh, mobility will increase as you increase the coupling, but rather slowly. On the other hand, if you include delocalization using delocalized kinetic Monte Carlo, that's these three lines here, the mobility shoots up very fast, 
and especially so in high dimensions. So in 1D, that's blue, it goes up fast. In 2D, it goes up even faster. In 3D, it goes up so fast that we couldn't keep up and the computer broke down at this point. Uh, but you can see that already at these modest couplings, you're getting an enhancement that's, you know, um, you know, five or four or five times as high of a mobility as you would predict with classical hopping. And this is a manifestation of coherence of the fact that you have delocalized, delocalized states that are partially overlapping. So if I wanna have a trans, if I wanna have a hop from this yellow state to this brown state, um, there's a, a, a large amount of overlap between the yellow and the brown states and these molecules in between. And this is only possible because of the delocalization between them. So this is very much analogous to super transfer, although it's a bit of a messier uh, system than the kind of clean, well, relatively clean stuff you get in photosynthesis. Um, and just most recently, just to show you some new work, I mean, this is new as well, but some unpublished work, uh, Daniel has extended this uh, work to delocalization to chart separation. Uh, again, this is to, uh, to kind of address this hypothesis that the reason charges separate are organic semiconductor uh, heterojunctions is because they're delocalized. The idea being that here is the Coulomb potential U of R as a function of separation. And at low separation, if the charges, if the electron and the hole, so this is a orange is the donor, blue is the acceptor, and the electron and the hole here are localized on adjacent molecules, that's a very strong Coulomb attraction. You're deep in the well, but if they're slightly delocalized, even a little bit, then you would be already starting on from over here. And so they don't have as much of an energetic barrier to overcome in order to separate. And so once they separate, you can you know, get separated, largely delocalized charges far apart. Um, and again, here is the, the, just the result. Um, um, uh, again, I'll just draw your attention to these two curves, which are the important ones. The, the blue is um, classical hopping. Orange is, is include delocalization. And this is as a function of coupling. So as you increase the couplings, as you increase the delocalization, the efficiency, the IQE of the chart separation can go from 10% up to 50%, okay? A huge increase in the charge separation efficiency. This is for thermalized CT states. If your CT states are not thermalized, if they're hot, you can get an increase in, in classically, you get higher efficiency. That's the blue circles here. But even then, if you turn on the delocalization, you jump from 40% IQE to 80%. So in the, and this is in a particular set of parameters, but you can see here that there's a potential for a huge improvement of delocalization explaining what's happening in, in organic semiconductor heterojunctions. So uh, let me sort of conclude. One thing is coherence matters. Only sometimes you have to be careful about the language, uh, but the, there is a big role of super transfer in photosynthesis. We've classified all the possible enhancements. None of them have been shown experimentally. So if anyone wants to explain, um, try to build some of these molecules, um, get in touch but super transfer is most likely to be the one that's important for practical applications. And I do think that it is, a, or versions of it exist in organic semiconductors where it dramatically enhances both the mobility and the efficiency of OPVs, but we still need clear experimental tests uh, of the relationship between microstructure um, coherence and device performance. So um, I'll leave this slide up here. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak to you and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Ivan. Uh, very interesting talk. So we'll throw it open for questions. I have a question. Um, Ivan, nice talk. Thank you so much. Thanks. Um, so my question is about the ultrafast experiment. So basically, my understanding is that uh, using ultrafast pulses, basically, you generate coher a coherence and energy. And then as a result of, um, of what you would call spatial coherence, then this, this coherence and energy can then propagate. And then you observe um, a signal, or the beating signal. Now, I, I acknowledge that the beating signal can be due to um, other factors such as co uh, coherence and molecular vibration, for instance. Um, so, so that part is unclear. So to, to be able to separate the, uh, the, the different sorts of coherence is important. So, I, my question really is, um, how can you separate, you know, the uh, what, what you would call spatial and energy coherences? 
it's not easy and I'm not, I hope no one got the impression that I was poo-pooing all the ultra-fast spectroscopy experiments. I think that these are critical experiments which are essential for sort of formulating the dynamics that are happening in the Hamiltonian, right? It's just that um, those beatings are, as Tag said, and probably vibrational, but also um, it's probably the case that, um, or it's certainly the case that in sunlight, those beatings would not play a functional role. Uh, but if you wanted to kind of parametrize the Hamiltonians, like the ones that I've done here, there's no better way to do it than ultra-fast spectroscopy. So I think that kind of separating the things would involve, for example, if you really wanted to demonstrate, you know, this kind of um, particular kind of coherent enhancement, I mean, you could do it. This could, I mean, I was joking that I said these are molecules and I'm a theorist, but you could make molecules that are connected in this particular way. And um, the dipole moments have to be aligned in precise ways. There's a stuff that I didn't tell you about, but this is something that isn't a testable prediction, right? Like you, you build a molecule like this and then you shine different kinds of light, whether it's coherent or incoherent. And the prediction is you're gonna get twice as much um, efficiency in transport. Very interesting, thank you. Ivan, can I ask a question, um, please? Please. I've got lots of questions. It was very interesting, I have to say. Um, so in terms of um, the super transfer, uh, do you have a feel, and you kind of touched on it a little bit, you, you mentioned it in answer to tax question. Um, there was a question about, you know, the comment about the dipole and, uh, and then the comment about the, the, the molecules. Now in the natural system, there are lots of chromophores do you have an idea from your sort of um, modeling, because you said you twisted some of them out of connection, about the number of molecules you need to have super transfer and what the minimum dipole moment is of those molecules mm. when they're okay. in that? Yeah. Um, the, minimum, the minimum model is, I can answer that question, it's this one. Uh, so you need two, you need two donors and one acceptor, so three molecules. Um, uh, again, they have to be aligned in particular ways and all that kind of stuff. Um, is there a minimum dipole moment? Um, I, I don't think so. I think in, in, let me think about it. So essentially what the, the limit would be set by the gap, this thing here, the splitting being larger than the thermal energy, basically, roughly speaking. So that means that your coupling has to be around 25 millivolts, which is perfectly within the realm of possibility for exotonic couplings. So you need to have exotonic couplings. For chlorophylls, you can get hundreds of millivolts for um, exotonic coupling. So but there's no, in, in practice, I'm like, molecules should be bright, but any kind of standard chromophore would work. Okay, thank you. Were there any other questions? If there isn't Bronson, um, I'd just like to make a uh, sort of a preliminary announcement. Um, the AU Chaos um, uh, Committee hasn't met yet to formally um, start the organization, but it is the intention um, given the uh, state of um, um, COVID and the state of the vaccine rollouts and everything else that will have the, um, the symposium that we had to um, put off last year um, in December of this year. Um, so please keep an eye out uh, on the AU Chaos website. Uh, it will be um, held where we're planning to hold it last year, which is just down in Coolangatta on the New South Wales Queensland border. Um, and uh, I'm very much looking forward to the community getting back together again in person because I think it's fantastic um, having these uh, seminar series and Bronson's been an absolute champion of keeping them, keeping them going. Um, uh, but there's nothing quite like being together. And so uh, uh, the committee will meet uh, over the next couple of weeks to actually organize timing and uh, everything else and application process. Um, so we'll keep you informed about that, um, the timelines associated with abstract submissions and everything else. And if you have uh, given a talk as part of the AU Chaos Symposium series, um, that doesn't mean you can't put an abstract in for the symposium itself, because of course, 
everyone does lots of work and so you should have more work to present there uh, at, at any rate. Anyway, so I just wanted to give a heads up on, on that um, because I know we're now in March and people are starting to think a little bit more about what might be possible. Um, so that's the, the current plan. So um, thanks Bronson for, you, didn't, you weren't aware of that advertisement, but uh, there it is. That's very good to hear. Um, yeah, pleased to, uh, to hear, I'm sure everyone else is as well. Um, pleased to hear that uh, we, we can have a, an in-person conference again. Uh, the world is returning to normal slowly. Um, okay, I think uh, we'll leave it there then. Um, thank you very much uh, to our speakers. Uh, thank you to our audience members for coming along. Uh, it's been a, a pretty good turnout for an online seminar, so uh, that's great to see. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll have another, we'll continue running these online seminars uh, if there's interest in, in that, and there certainly seems to be interest uh, from this one. So, you know, we'll, we'll do it again. We'll be back uh, next month with another talk, uh, another set of talks. Um, so thank you, everyone. Have a good day, uh, and we will see you later.